Uh, Professor Richard Kingsford will tell us about the wild deserts part of the Save Our Species initiative. Uh, talks about 35,000 hectares of desert ecosystem in the Sturt National Park in northwest New South Wales. They're being restored by eradicating or controlling introduced animals, managing native herbivores and reintroducing regionally extinct mammals. Um, just briefly, uh, Richard is a river ecologist and conservation biologist who's worked extensively across the wetlands and rivers of the Murray-Darling Basin and Lake Eyre Basin. His research has influenced the policy and management of rivers in Australia, including through involvement on state and federal advisory committees. His expertise includes river ecology, water use in Australia, wetland ecology, water birds, river policy, the effects of dam building, rewilding, adaptive management of ecosystems and conservation biology. Um, our most accomplished uh, professor. And with that, um, I haven't uh, have stolen all your thunder, uh, Richard, but I'll hand over to you <coughs> now to make your presentation. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Kim. Um, you might wonder why a wetland ecologist is in the desert, but hopefully I'll be able to <laughs> let you know why as I go. And just before I start, I just would like to thank um, your group for supporting our various uh, honours and, and PhD students over the years. Um, it's been fantastic. Um, so this is, I guess, the Wild Deserts Project. We have quite a big team. As you saw, there was almost a cricket team there of people involved in this. And the um, most of us uh, sit on a sort of executive and management committee. The bottom two people there, yeah, Dr. Reed Pedler and Dr. Rebecca West, they're essentially the engine room of the project. They're a married couple that live out at um, Sturt National Park at Tipperborough. Uh, everybody will know the sort of major problem we've got. One of the major problems we've got in Australia is having the world's worst mammal extinction record um, with 27 species since European colonisation. <clears throat> culprits are really well known. They're the feral cats that arrived here in the late 1800s. And of course, the foxes that came in 1900s and also rabbits in terms of competition in the late 1820s. And so this is the sort of major threats that have <gasps> affected so many of these, what we call critical weight range mammals. Many have become extinct. Some still remain on some of the islands. So what do we do at Wild Desert? So this is where we're working right up in the corner of the state within Sturt National Park, and I'll show you a map a bit closer to that area in a minute, just near Tipperborough. We manage 350 um, square kilometres of the park. It's one of the biggest parks in New South Wales, so about 11% of it. And we're doing feral animal control. We're, we've been servicing a campground and visitor services. Um, it's interesting. And quite exciting, I think, as a scientist to be not only doing the science, but also being involved in the management. And uh, as Kim mentioned in my intro, it's one of the things I've got more interested in is how do we connect um, our management to science? So I'll tell you a bit more about it, but we've built these two predator-free exclosures, exclosures meaning to keep out cats and foxes, and we're busily reintroducing seven locally extinct mammals. So they used to be there, but um, have gone extinct um, and they survived on various islands. So that's and, and other safe haven sanctuaries around the place. But we also have to manage kangaroos. And obviously as researchers, we're interested in understanding what's going on and contributing to monitoring and thinking about what the next best thing is instead, as well as the safe hands to get some of these animals beyond the fences. 
So we do actually have the diaries of Charles Sturt who went up through there on his way up to the Cooper and, and stayed at Fort Grey, which is where the some of you may have been up there, right up in the corner where there's a homestead where uh, recent and, and Rebecca live. And in his diary, there were quite a few um, notes about the small mammals that were up there and that have now become extinct. So it's good to have that information and, and know what we're, we're aiming for. So we were given in 2016 um, a list of seven species that used to be in that part of the world that where there were still some um, populations in Australia and we were asked to, as part of our contract over 10 years, to reintroduce these seven species. So greater bilbies, shark bay bandicoots, which used to be called western barred bandicoots, golden bandicoots, burrowing betongs, stickness rats, cresttail mulgaras and western poles. And here's a a better map, if you like, a more schematic map of what this is all about. So that corner up in the in the top left of your screens shows Cameron Corner, which is the corner between the states of New South Wales, Queensland and South Australia, and where we're based, Fort Grey, and those other areas are the areas that we manage in that northwest. And we have a large area that we rent from national parks, so which used to be part of the sheep station called Fort Grey. And these are the, the, the big areas there. We've got 104 square kilometers of what we call a wild training zone. And these two exclosures, which we deliberately named after the local Aboriginal traditional owners, Thipa, meaning alive in Wonkamara, and minku meaning good or happy in Malinyapa. And we felt they were an appropriate names to really bring back these animals that were once there. So what we were, the, the cards we were dealt was something a bit like this, although this is probably more like Queensland with the dingo there, but this is what you might call a degraded desert ecosystem where you've got lots of kangaroos, you might have a dingo, uh, you've also got foxes and, and feral cats. And there's generally a, a, um, a major drivers in terms of rainfall and, and sometimes fire. But these are the dynamics around some of these ecosystems. And there's more and more evidence that um, what happens if you don't have dingoes in these systems, this is a paper, a PhD student of Mike Letnick's and myself, where he looked at um, areas with exclosures and some control areas. The exclosures uh, didn't have it, couldn't get any kangaroos into them and the controls kangaroos uh, could access. And what we found was that um, the areas where you had large numbers of kangaroos resulted in a decrease in seed-eating birds. And this was primarily thought to be because there was there were high densities of kangaroos suppressed the grass seed production. So there are increasingly around the world, not just here in Australia, an understanding that these food webs are important in terms of determining what goes on in the entire ecosystem. So our project is essentially trying to do this. So if you have a look at those two exclosures, Thipa and Minku, you can see the seven mammal species that we want to reintroduce there. And then the wild training zone, we call it a wild training zone, and I'll come to talk a little bit more about this later on, but the idea is that we will still have um, some feral animals in there, but we're hoping to keep their numbers low enough that the um, locally extinct mammals can increase. And then of course, in South Australia, there's lots of um, feral animals, but they're also dingoes. 
and then in the rest of Sturt National Park, you don't find any of these um, uh, obviously locally extinct mammals, but also small mammals aren't as many and you've got lots of kangaroos there. And there's pastoral areas to the south. So in terms of um, starting this system uh, with no restoration, if you like, so Sturt National Park before 2016, that little blue area at the top is a, is a farm dam. So there were some farm dams around there that were providing too much water for kangaroos and predators. And then of course you had kangaroos, the green arrows, uh, the sort of influence of different species where they're positive impacts, red arrows are negative impacts. So you can see that foxes and cats were ha having a whole range of negative impacts and kangaroos were having negative impacts on things like the soils and, and some of the plants. So that's really what the ecosystem looked like. Now, in our restoration, we're predicting this is what's going to happen, is as we bring back these various species um, with the dashed lines around them, that we'll see them have positive impacts on things like the soils, like bilbies are ecosystem engineers. And there will also be obviously some negative impacts as well, but we won't have that predation pressure from the ferals, obviously, in these two exclosures. Um, nearby in that wild training zone, which is 104 square kilometres, we will still have cats and foxes, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on. But the problem there is that those areas that border the dingo fence, so the dingo fence between South Australia and New South Wales, and New South Wales and Queensland is really only supposed only stops dingoes. It's quite penetrable, although not completely for foxes and cats. And so we can't manage those numbers. But what's really exciting about that is that in that blue area, we've actually fenced to link up with the dingo fence. So where you see the, see the pink there. The pinks are now connected by a fence and they're also connected to the South Australian dingo fence and also to Queensland dingo fence. So that wild training zone is now completely fenced. It has some really big fences on the eastern side, but as I mentioned, the dingo fence on South Australia and Queensland side is leaky. Now, what we're trying to do there is say that this is a massive area, but if we can get systems that manage foxes and cats in there and also allow these locally extinct mammals to increase, then we've got a great opportunity to essentially take back the desert for these wonderful animals. So what we expect to happen at the beginning, we had a fairly simple system with lots of ferals. Um, <clears throat> we're at the sort of middle state now We've got the fenced exclosures and we're trying to establish all of these locally extinct mammal populations. And by the end of it in the wild training zone, we're expecting to have a few um, feral animals, but lots of uh, Australian mammals in there as well that we can um, continue to maintain at, at um, replacement populations. So to begin this massive project, we have a lot of barriers. A lot of challenges but first of all and we even wrote about these there was a plan of management for like all national parks it needed to be changed to allow for this major uh, infrastructure to be established and then we had to do a an EIS which is called a review of environmental factors about 350 pages we had to explain what the environmental impacts of our work would be, what the impacts on cultural or archaeological systems would be, whether there would be any social or visitor impacts. There were eight pieces of legislation that we needed to comply with and similarly related policy documents. So it took us about nearly two years to go through this process so that we could actually start to build our fences. And of course, um, part of that was 
making a connection with the Wonkamara and Malinyapa groups who came in and helped us with our cultural surveys. And it was wonderful to uh, build that connection, which we continue to maintain. And part of that was to gain an Aboriginal heritage impact so that we could um, follow the course of our fences and disturb um, some areas that, or, and try and avoid other areas. So if you look at our uh, exclosures, when I put up another map, you'll see that they've got a few wiggles in them. Uh, they're not rectangles or squares, straight. They're that way because we have avoided some of these cultural important areas, but also um, avoided some other areas that are vulnerable to um, water damage. <clears throat> so part of it was to build these um, specialised netting fences. Uh, those exclosures, if you like, are four by five kilometres, so 20 square kilometres. And then we have wing fences as well. So we built about 50 kilometres of this fencing. It has a foot apron to stop rabbits uh, on both sides of the fence. And it has this uh, floppy top, which um, goes over the tops, top of the fence to stop the cats climbing out on the outside of the fence. So when they reach the top, they fall down rather than climbing over the fence. We have also electrified one of our exclosures and we have specialised gates with, um, again, trying to ensure that we do not get cats um, able to get into the area. One of the first things we needed to do once we built our fences was make sure that we had no feral animals within them. That required um, Reese and Beck to map uh, more than a thousand um, rabbit warrens, those little white dots were empty rabbit warrens, but there were um, plenty that were red and had to be fumigated. And other areas where we had to remove um, rabbits by catching them, uh, Reese trained his dog to be able to catch or find rabbits so that they could, every rabbit could be caught. And that was a deliberate first go was to focus on the rabbits as prey for cats and foxes, remove them first, and then track to see if there are any cats or foxes in the area. In some respects, we were lucky that this coincided with that terrible drought. And so there was widespread um, death of rabbits and also kangaroos there. And in the end, when we did quite a our animal, lot of our animal tracking, you can see in the Polaris there, we're dragging um, a contraption behind, which essentially brushes the dunes so that we can check for tracks and see uh, if we've got any cats and foxes. So, we were feral free by the 13th of September, 2018 in that Northern uh, Thipper um, exclosure and the 27th of February, 2019 in the Minku exclosure, which was a really exciting um, achievement. No one's achieved much eradication of rabbits over such a large area. So it was a real credit, uh, particularly to Reese, who managed to um, almost single-handedly do that. I guess the other major innovation we have going here is um, are the Felix uh, grooming apps, which were invented by John Reed, who is part of our team. These work on the basis that they um, fire out a laser beam and you can see that there are three places that those laser beams fire out. And you, if you get an interception of those three together, then it will um, recognize it as a cat and fires out a 1080 gel onto the fur of the cat, which will then lick its fur and um, it, it, it dies very soon afterwards. Now, it's one of the most difficult animals, feral cats, to control. And so we have needed some of these more sophisticated approaches to um, cat control. So we do currently have um, four of these 
uh, Felix's and we are ordering some more uh, to improve our cat control in the area. Um, the idea remembering just to bring the number of cats down in that um, wild training zone so that these locally extinct um, mammals can increase. Now, the other really interesting thing, um, certainly this is um, one of my main interests, is how do you how do we link the science to the to the management? And we call this approach the strategic adaptive management approach. Uh, the idea of this is that we make decisions knowing that there's a lot of uncertainty, but we're using data to make our decisions and constantly improving our management with the view to improving the ecosystems. And it's, to me, a really interesting way in which ecological science becomes much more integrated with management. There's also much clearer accountability and transparency for solving problems. It's so very much treats these as social ecological systems. So it's not just about the ecology, it's all of the other things that you need in management to make it work. So I don't know if you can see this rather nasty graphic here, but I'll take you through it slowly. Um, start off with a vision. It was very important for us to come up with a vision for what we were going to do. And it wasn't just about um, putting seven locally extinct mammals back in. It was about how do we understand, restore, and promote these desert ecosystems through ecosystem manipulations, reintroductions, and collaborative partnerships. So it was really about restoring ecosystems. And you see at level two there, <clears throat> um, you might want to have a look at some of the green boxes, but just at level two, it's really about that those high level objectives, partnerships, what we're doing around the ecosystem, what sort of resources are we bringing to the table? What are the planning hoops that we have to go through and how do we communicate what we're talking about in this project? And then there are a whole range of level three um, objectives there, which is much finer level of what we're doing in each of those boxes. So I'll go on to just the ecosystem parts now. This is a detailed um, objectives hierarchy for three of those green boxes and only three in that ecosystem box. So what we're doing in, in terms of introducing introduced mammal species, what we're doing with feral cats in this case, um, kangaroo management, how are we managing them within those exclosures? So you can see there where um, we remove them from the exclosures, but in the wild training zone, we're essentially putting out troughs when, because uh, there's no standing water up there. And we're using one-way gates to make sure we don't get too many kangaroos up there. And then of course, our contracted job, which is to re reintroduce these locally extinct mammals like the bilbies. How are we gonna do that? Translocation plan, where do we get them from? How do we make sure they're breeding successfully? Their genetics is all good. So, you know, these are all the detailed nuts and bolts of what we're actually doing for each one of these objectives. And of course, on top of all that, we're measuring the hell out of the place. <laughs> so um, we have five management treatments and you can see the red dots there are seven um, sites within FIPA and similarly Minku. And then of course, we've got wild training zone sites. And then we have controls in South Australia and then in Sturt National Park, the yellow ones, outside um, the area that we're doing all of our work in. And then, so in total, there are seven sites in each one of those treatments. So total of 35 monitoring sites. And then when each, within each one of these sites, there's actually further um, differentiation in that we survey what we're calling the top of the dune, um, and then the swale, which is the bottom of the dune. So these are, you can see on that um, picture on the left, you can see those northwest dunes that run through this area as a desert. And each one of those swale and dune plots is a hectare. And so we're measuring for reptiles, frogs, invertebrates, vegetation, and also birds. And on top of that, we're also doing drone surveys. So a lot 
lot going on to see what happens when you do all these measuring the impacts and doing it in an experimental way so we can really understand cause and effect relationships. And of course, you know, we're trying to track ecosystem changes. And part of that is doing things like spotlighting. We're also trapping with pitfall traps. Uh, each year we have a lot of camera traps set up all over the place. And we have counts of um, um, different animals crossing the tracks. We're monitoring our vegetation and we're collecting drone imagery each year to see how those changes might um, take effect. And some of these are really to guide us about when we put animals in. So this is the order we're using. So we start with the ecosystem engineers like bilbies, and then we put the insectivores and small predators in, herbivores, and then a top level predator in the Western quoll. And part of it is trying to make sure that we've got enough food for these different animals. Um, and do they have proximity to shelters? Um, and, and then what sort of ground cover do we have? Do they have places where they can hide? Remembering they're all still aerial predators. There are owls and there are birds of prey there. And then of course, um, you know, what our level of cats and foxes, particularly when we start to reintroduce these animals into the wild training zone. So we've had a bumper year this year. It's been fabulous. This is our fence in March in part of the area, absolutely underwater, but you know, it didn't last very long. We um, have excellent vegetation growth. So the animals are doing, doing really well. Here's um, our pitfall trap in 2019 after the drought and the exact same spot on the right in 2021. You can see what a stark difference there is. Uh, remembering it's a desert, of course, but there's so much more green cover everywhere um, in the figure on the right. And we've even had flooding out there. There's a Ramsar site, a wetland of international importance. So I'll probably be doing a bit of water bird work on the side, um, but that's flooded for the first time in about a decade. And there, we've even got um, various water bird, spreading, water bird species breeding like this gullbill tern on some of the smaller wetlands. So the first reintroduction we had was the Crestel mulgara, this um, feisty little animal, which is a, a, a micro predator. Uh, they uh, live just um, not far away in South Australia, so we were able to get some from there and bring them uh, across. <coughs> they have started to move since rabbit Khaleesi virus was re released in 1990. It seems to have been great for them, so they, they're doing quite well in South Australia. But we released 19 Malgaras in August 2020. Um, a lot of them came with young, which was fabulous, because amazingly, most of the female, well, all the females stayed, but most of the males did runners. Some of them went all the way back to South Australia. But as you can see we, on these camera traps, uh, we've got young everywhere. And, and by the end of last year, we estimated that we had 58 Malgaras that had um, essentially made wild deserts home, which was really exciting for us. And then our second reintroduction with the greater bilbies, and you can see this bilby has a transmitter on its tail so that we can track them for the first three months and make sure they're doing well. Uh, the transmitters are taken off after three months, and then we really don't see them again until we trap them once a year. But we now have 40 bilbies there, 20 bilbies in uh, each of those exclosures. Uh, as everybody probably knows, they are known for as ecosystem engineers because they dig a lot. And you can see uh, there's a huge difference where they've arrived and other places where they've essentially been doing digging all over the place. And of course, that sets up a whole range of different habitats for other animals as well. That's why they're a very important part of these ecosystems. And releasing them, I was lucky enough to take part in the first ones that came from Taronga. So it was really a very exciting part of it. 
Um, we did it with the local traditional owners. Uh, we had a smoking ceremony, that's um, Reese and Beck and Baby Isla, uh, and we also tracked them. And sometimes um, one of our transmitters would fall off and you didn't know whether the animal had died or in fact the transmitter had fallen off. But as you can see, <laughs> they get down pretty deep when we had to dig out one of those transmitters down on the bottom right. Um, they're amazing animals and their ability to dig through the sand and, and make this intricate um, uh, sort of network of, of, of burrows. Our third reintroduction, which happened this year in May and August, was the Shark Bay Bandicoot, which Sturt said the local Aboriginal people call the Talpiro. Um, we have only managed to get 13 of those, but they are already producing young there, which is exciting and some of those came with them. And they are really amazingly cute little animals. They are also diggers, but unlike um, bilbies, mostly they make nests uh, on the surface and hide. They're very cryptic and they rely on that to escape predators. Obviously they were one of the first ones probably to get eaten by foxes and cats um, who could smell them out. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the big um, questions that we're hoping to answer here is how to get these mammals beyond the fences. Um, as you can see with that brush tail bet on there, uh, they can be overly tame or naive as we call them, some of these mammals. They haven't really learnt that there's a big bad world out there. But some of our team have been working and Rebecca West has been doing some work there on betongs and others have done on bilbies where they've had betongs with cats. So 352 betongs and four cats that were all um, neutered obviously and radio collared. And what they found was that the betongs soon learned a whole range of anti-predator skills and the numbers did not decline with those four cats. So that's given us, I guess, the incentive and opportunity to try this big experiment in that wild training zone. And we're being funded by the New South Wales Environmental Trust to essentially do this. So we're hoping that between 2021 and 2030, if we're measuring bilbies and their predator awareness, that we'll be able to compare how much more they're predator aware in the wild training zone, as opposed to the control animals that we have in the exclosures. So that's the prediction. And what we're intending to do over this um, 10 year period is look at these four species, betongs, bilbies, malaras and quolls. And once they built up their populations to high enough levels that we can start releasing them into that wild training zone, then we will obviously have rabbits, cats and foxes in there. But our aim is to implement some very strong feral animal control in that wild training zone. And that it'll involve feral cat tracking and understanding what they're doing, but also optimizing these felixes so that when we need to, we can crack down on the number of cat foxes. So ultimately they will be there, but won't be allowed to increase, even though you know, they seem to have plenty of prey. It'll be a real challenge because there'll be a constant leaking through the dingo fence from Queensland and South Australia. And of course, as I mentioned, we're going to be managing cats. And in fact, we're starting to do that work right now. We're trying to understand what cats are doing in this space. And we currently have six cats that we have satellite collars on uh, in that part of the world. And the, the plan is to identify those patterns of movements of effective control. And here's um, a couple of weeks of, of movements uh, of two cats, that the blue and the green here, you can see the two exclosures, which they obviously can't get into, although it does look as if one's cut across there, but it's just because the fix 
um, it would have gone around the side there. But they're making extensive movements in the area that we're looking at. Uh, and so the plan is to not only track these, get some estimate of the numbers of cats that we have in the wild training zone. And we should say that we're amazed already about the number of cats that we've got in there. Um, we've been tracking them for some time and didn't realize that we had so many cats in there. And then obviously we'll deploy our grooming traps. And then ultimately it's about how successful we can be in terms of managing their interactions um, with the uh, locally extinct mammals that we'll reintroduce later. The other things we're doing up here is um, we really did do want this to be a place that people visit. So we have built a platform with um, signs here, which haven't all gone in yet, but they should be in in the next few months. Um, we have a parking area. We have built this massive um, bandicoot sculpture, you can see there, made out of discarded fencing wire. And that will be in the main visitor parking area. And then up at Cameron Corner, uh, we have another statue made out of wire with, with wreaths there um, of a bilby. And then at the campground, uh, at the Fort Grey campground, is another statue there on the right, if you can see, which is of a Western quoll. Um, again, uh, the idea is that people will get an idea of what we're doing. And ultimately, we hope that we'll be able to run some tours there, nocturnal tours, and show people around and see some of these animals that we brought back into the wild training zone. Our future plans, as you can see, there's lots to do. We still are monitoring. Uh, we've got a whole range of uh, um, analysis of what the cats are doing, trying to work out where they're moving. We are looking at improving the way uh, Felix uh, cat traps are working to ensure that we can keep our cat numbers down. We're also tracking kangaroos. So we have these gates uh, so that we don't get high densities of kangaroos in that wild training zone. And we're hoping a range of PhD and honor students and cadetships will be coming through and helping us in this great project that we're running. We're also um, continuing to reach out to traditional owners. Um, we have a range of volunteers who regularly come up and work with us on all sorts of things. We um, are also, as I mentioned already, we have about three PhD students here working, on, one on bilbies, one on malgaras, um, and another one on invertebrates. Uh, Reese and Beck are very good at um, having field days for the school kids. Uh, so it's changed um, a lot of people's views about having us up there. And of course, we're looking to develop the campground and, and our interpretation area. Um, I thought I'd show a picture of Reese and Beck and Isla um, with a dusky hopping mouse. And really, um, they are what make the place tick, a young couple used to living in the arid zone are just fabulous. They've just had baby number two, Zachary. Um, and one of our challenges to protect them and their time to uh, essentially run this massive project and also provide for you know, visitors to come. So we try and do quite a lot in terms of um, our publications. Uh, we do quite a bit on the media. We have a newsletter that comes out uh, uh, quarterly that we're working on. And the idea is that we'll um, engage with as many people as, as possible. We are also have lots of volunteers that come out to wild deserts. There's all sorts of things that are done there, including some of the things I've talked about. We are doing that massive um, scientific survey across those 35 sites that happens each year in April. We do bird surveys, usually in August, but we're certainly very curtailed at the moment with the um, uh, with COVID restrictions. Uh, we're also doing um, bilby and mulgara monitoring and other species, usually in September each year. And we're hoping 
to have some field work scholarships in the future. So just as a summary, um, I guess this project builds on a significant investment by the New South Wales government. Um, we're trying to tackle the next big thing in reintroduction biology. And, and that's how do you get these mammals beyond these fenced reserves? And in, in so doing, you restore these desert ecosystems. We're doing a lot of work on innovative feral animal predator management, um, which is around how do you make these uh, locally extinct and mammals more predator aware, not so naive. Lots of scientific monitoring. And of course, we're trying to do as much as we can in terms of public education and awareness. Okay, I think I'm done there now. So I might hand back to Kim and uh, see if there are any questions. I'm very happy to take some questions if anybody's interested in asking me anything. Oh, thanks, Richard. That was fascinating. The, the breadth and depth of the of the project is huge, isn't it? Yes. Oh, it is. It's great. Yeah. Um, okay. So, communicating out there with people, um, you can put questions in on the uh, on the chat line. Uh, you could put up your hand, um, and I might not be able to see all these, uh, but Adrian's there helping me out. Shall I um, ask, ask answer this one? Are you copying information yep. with similar projects like? AWC, Australian Wildlife, yeah. So Australian Wildlife Conservancy, yes, yes, we do. So they, you would probably, a lot of you know that they've got a project in the Pilliga and also down at Mallee Cliffs. And we do swap a fair bit of information between the two. We're, we're also obviously working through national parks who are the project proponents. So there's quite a lot of connection through there as well. So there is quite a bit of that. So. Okay, thanks, Richard. Um, anybody else there? Debbie? Debbie, do you want to yeah. go ahead, unmute and ask your question? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, hello, Richard. Oh, hi, Debbie. Great to see How you. How are you going? Great. Um, <laughs> right. It's always fascinating listening to your work. It's always fantastic and it's always directly related to conservation. So are you going to be testing whether dingoes have a place in this system or not? <laughs> uh, that's a difficult question, Debbie, as I'm sure you know. Um, and, you know, we're under strict instructions that at the moment the New South Wales government has a no dingoes policy. So the answer to your question is until such time as um, that ever changes, I mean, we, we have to control dingoes. So if dingoes come into that wild training zone, we essentially have to um, shoot to kill them. So, um, you know, that there was a paper published some time ago about even fencing off Sturt National Park and running a dingo fence on the other side of it. So mm -hmm. those of you who, who aren't aware of some of the discussions around these points, the dingoes are supposed to be quite good at suppressing cat and fox populations. And so, you know, a bit like um, wolves in Yellowstone, they are the apex predator, if you like, and, and can certainly um, push down uh, populations. Can I ask one short question? Is there any difference between uh, naivety between a captive reared source animal yeah. or a wild caught source animal to release? Very good question. Um, so we are hoping to do some of those experiments. So we're hoping to, most of the animals we're getting at the moment are wild in that they're coming from places like Arid Recovery or Thistle Island. So we're not getting them really from zoos. And even the ones that we got from Dubbo, they haven't been exposed to people because they've been in that sanctuary, um, which I think is a hundred hectares. So, but still they, haven't seen a cat or a fox and not they're still pretty naive thank you richard okay. so shall i go through some of these other questions yes, that I've yeah, got in the chat? thank you richard. there for you to have a look at yep thanks very much deb how do you stop visitors with bad animals going into the park 
Yes, so that's a that's I mean essentially people um because we're in the middle of a Sturt National Park, people are supposed not supposed to have dogs in there. So we're hoping that they don't. Um, we're not actually allowing people to go where our exclosures are. So that's a road that goes through the wild training zone. So that will be mostly the interaction that people have. Um, we do have um, quasi sort of ranger powers where we can stop people and ask for their identity. We can't prosecute them, but we can um, refer them to national parks. Uh, the next question I've got there is, have you monitored changes in the native flora? Uh, absolutely. Um, we are spending a lot of time working on the native flora. And in fact, we have a herbarium of up to 300 plants. We've had a botanist come up there, now made it into a digital herbarium so we can go out there and identify the plants. We've had a bumper year in terms of identifying them. We are in each one of those plots, we do a survey of all of the perennial species um, in the plot and identify the species and, and their reproductive status. But we also have odd rats that are much more fine grained so that we can pick up um, some of the annuals. And we are also currently doing some work using the drone imagery to see what happens for some of the perennials or what happened to them during the drought. We had quite a large die off of some of the acacias and, um, and mulga. And we're trying to work out what the reason and how widespread that was because of the importance of that. So absolutely we're measuring lots of flora. Um, how, how do you determine at what point to introduce a new species to the exclosure? Um, if you might've seen, we had those lists of of different species and when we were going to bring them in. We had the basic structure of saying ecosystem engineers in first, so bilbies to, to um, dig up the place, get the nutrients working. And then we've got the um, shark bay bandicoots and then next year we're going to bring in the golden bandicoots. And the idea is that we're going to bring these small animals up before we bring in the big predator, which in this case is a quoll. So the Western quoll will be the last one to come in, but we're constantly monitoring to see how much food there is in that landscape for each of these species. So that's that's the main, those are the main criteria we use. Um, the only other thing to say is we haven't thought about bringing in um, betongs early because they breed up very quickly and, and they can trash the joint very quickly. So we want to make sure that we're able to manage them properly. Um, are relationships with neighbouring properties and states productive? Um, we don't see much of the states people because they're a long way away. But I, I have to say the neighbouring properties, um, we've got this amazing relationship up there. When we first went up there, there was quite a bit of, even with the National Parks staff, there's quite a bit of pushback. Um, essentially what's, even though I had worked for National Parks for a long time and knew a lot of people, um, there was still some antagonism. But um, Reese and Beck have, have integrated amazingly into the, into the local community and they're part of the, um, you know, the uh, Women's Association, Country Women's Association, well, Beck is, she's also now a paramedic because she's the only person on the, that road. So there's a whole range of things like that that they've done. Um, uh, how are foxes controlled? Um, there aren't that many foxes there, but the foxes are, are also controlled by those Felixes. They will recognize a, a fox, but there is widespread baiting of foxes by national parks and they, they do readily take baits, unlike cats, which are much more problematic. The Felix are cats, uh, the Felix are traps from, from Richard Kitt, um, Kitt and Richard Streamer. Um, yeah, look, they, there's been a lot of work on those and quite a few published papers. They um, don't seem to um, get false triggers for quolls where they've been used, but that's certainly one of the things that we will test. They're unlike cats in that they won't um, generally groom themselves the way cats will once they've got um, moisture on their fur. So 
um, we're certainly looking into that and that um, took us a while to make sure that we had given the assurance to the state government around all of that. Uh, are we controlling weeds? Yes, um, we are controlling weeds. Um, uh, we have, in fact, you know, there's probably more weed control up there than there's ever been. But Reese and Beck uh, are up there um, and looking out for it. So there's some cactus up there, prickly pear. Um, there's a Nguru burr in different places, but none of it's really got going, um, which is great. So we don't have a major weed problem up there. Um, then there's a question about goats and the number of, of goats. Um, thankfully, uh, there were goats up there, but we don't have any goats in our patch. There, there are quite a few goats to the south. They don't seem to like the dune country as much as the hills. Um, there may be some other goat west of um, uh, west of where sorry east of where we are in the ranges on Sturt National Park interesting in one when I went up there and spoke to the field officer in national parks he very proudly showed me a picture of when he'd shot a water buffalo up there <laughs> you might think well how the hell did a water buffalo get up there but apparently it wandered up from some place in South Australia and went into the national park so there's all sorts of feral animals that get up into these systems. Um, funding, yes, well, funding's always a big challenge. Um, uh, this is a 10 year project, so up to 2026, uh, it, it will be those projects that will require to keep going. And, and we hope the state government will tender again and that we would be successful uh, in a tender in another 10 years. Uh, we already have some money from the New South Wales Environmental Trust for doing work um, in terms of monitoring beyond fencing till 2030. And the other really quite interesting thing is UNSW has actually, apart from our in-kind contribution, um, has put up quite a bit of money in terms of establishing a, a lot of accommodation up there, which has been great. And it's um, been a significant in input as well as you know funds for research uh erratic rainfall yeah <laughs> um it has been erratic um in fact you know it was one of the most two two most difficult years was 2018 and 2019 for my team up there because that was in the middle of a drought and there were huge dust storms no water um you know 10 to 20 dead kangaroos on their front lawn every day that they'd have to drag away and they and and nothing to show for it because nothing but planning approval so they were they were almost being driven mad by not actually getting any jobs done um and i guess you know we know that these animals cope with that sort of thing so now that we've got them in there and we've got the predators uh we think we can do it um in terms of the scientific monitoring Yes, you know, these big patterns, you, you often need long data to, to see what's going on. But that's the beauty about our approach is that we've got these control areas where through comparison, we're hoping to see those changes much, much earlier. What effect in terms of birds of prey? Um, Look, we would expect us to get more birds of prey. There are grey falcons up there anyway, um, and black-breasted buzzards. Um, but you would think if we were getting more marsupials, um, small mammals, we're likely to see more owls, um, barn owls, we're li likely to see perhaps some um, more kites up there, maybe brown falcons. So I'm sure we'll get more birds of prey. We probably will get fewer um, wedge-tailed eagles, which rely on overabundant kangaroos in that part of the world, which die during these huge die-offs. Um, but it's it's one exciting things that we're expecting all sorts of things to happen. In fact, we've just got a PhD student who's starting to look at the microbiology of the soils to see if you see some major changes in the ecology of the soils over time as you get all these these um, bilbies working away and, and their thing in, in these different parts of the, of the system. I think I've gone through all my questions. Yeah, Adrian, all, all the you have any, any there? <laughs> no, 
Um, yeah, that's. Uh, I can't see any other questions, Richard. Okay, well, I might um, just okay. throw in one last question. Um, volunteers, um, yeah. <laughs> self-interest <laughs> question. Do they need any skills? Uh, uh, not really. We... Um, it, it's it's more a case of um, tying in. Uh, on on if if you look up Wild Desert's Facebook site, usually at the beginning of each year or sometime early in the year, there's a call out um, for people to come and do some things. Um, they they do. Um, we do have a Rotary Club that comes in from Victoria with a whole range of people and skills that have done great things there and around the camp and and all all those sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> to some extent, it, it depends, you know, how much room there is and what's actually going on at a particular time of the year. We are starting to um, get overloved <laughs> in terms of people mm -hmm. uh, wanting to visit. But, you know, there is, there is also going to be, um, over in the next couple of years, there's going to be a campsite there and lots of interpretation areas. So even if, if you don't get a, an opportunity to volunteer, um, you know, hopefully there'll be lots of opportunity to really see and enjoy how this, this desert area is changing. Mm, sounds great. Okay, there's one just popped up. Richard, there's Fort, a couple Fort more Gray. Um, on the, uh, I th I'm, on I'm the trying platform. to remember, there is a derivation. Fort Gray, I think, was just when Sturt went up there and, you know, they used to establish these areas and call them different forts, I think. I'm not not sure if I, I've, I've entirely got that right, but it, it, it's certainly something to do with that. Looks like Kim's... Are you still there, Kim? You seem yes, to be I'm frozen. Still all right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kim, I've been trying to, but I can't figure out how to do it. Ask a question about the funding. Oh, <laughs> I can hear you. Um, oh, so is <laughs> ongoing funding going to be a problem, or it's a good you know, question? Is that a um, in the future. Uh, look, I think when governments do this, they realise it's got to be funded ongoing. Can't sort of half-heartedly do this. It's a major commitment of funds. Um, look, you know, it it was for governments, it's been really fabulous to guarantee 10 years of funding at least. And, and the, there would be a lot of pressure. And, and to, to give them some credit, uh, if it failed in that 10 years, they'd say, well, we would have learnt quite a lot. Um, there's no doubt in my mind this is going to be a roaring success. So, you know, there's great opportunities to do more and, and do it in another 10 years and do some more things in that space. So, and, and particularly if you start getting some funding coming back in, so you get more visitors coming through town, there are a whole lot of um, byproducts of that sort of investment that I think would, would be realised in the longer term that would also help with the bottom, uh, with the bottom line. Thank Richard, uh, in, uh, say, 20 or 30 years' time, you, know, yeah. you might expect the uh, things to settle down and sort of plateau. What, what is your vision for that picture? <laughs> um, the, uh, my ideal vision in 20 or 30 years' time was that you, you've cracked it. You really have got these locally extinct mammals under control. They know what a cat and fox predator is. Um, you've actually also worked out how you can control cat and foxes in these big landscapes at low levels, and you could even imagine taking the fences down. I mean, that that would that that's probably the holy grail that you would have enough confidence that um, these animals have really taken back Australia's deserts, and you've got the cat, fox and rabbit problem under control. But that's probably not going to happen in my lifetime. Mm. Richard, something to think question. on. How did you manage to get involved in this project uh, with your background in water? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I, I, it was great because I was the director of the Centre for Ecosystem Science and we had some people in there who were doing work in this space. 
Um, we also had, I had certainly spent um, probably three or four or five years thinking about management and science. And so the New South Wales government was quite interested in linking, showing how you could link them better together. So see, we assembled a team. Um, we also um, collaborated with Taronga and we had to go obviously through a competitive process and, and you know, of the three projects that got given out, um, two went to Australian Wildlife Conservancy and, and we got the third one. But a few people have asked me that and, um, well, look, I mean, I think it's a great challenge and I was really excited to have a go. <laughs> and I think, I think Debbie's got her hand up for another question. Is that right, Deb? It could be, yep. Uh, well, it, it goes back a bit, Richard, but how will you to distinguish any differences in abundance of the introduced species uh, between drought effects and, yeah. and, and bad effects coming from unwanted predators? Yeah, I mean, I think, Debbie, the, the real way we're going to do that is with these control areas. So, you know, what one would expect is in a drought, everything will go down, but those areas where you've got cats and foxes that you're not controlling, mm. i.e. in Sturt National Park, um, you will have a much bigger impact than you would have in the exclosures or in the wild training zone. Mm. So it's, it's essentially um, an experimental design where you've got uh, these various treatments and you've got some controls occurring as well where you don't have those treatments. Mm. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> um, Deb, actually, on that note, uh, I wonder if I could um, could ask you to um, give the thanks to Richard for tonight's uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, Richard. That was absolutely fascinating and extremely uh, exciting presentation. Um, I think we're all kind of in amazement thinking, you know, looking to the future and hoping we'll visit when some of these species uh become established and it's very exciting for our organization to help sponsor in a very small way at least some of the students who might be embarking on these projects and uh, we really appreciate you making the time because we know you're a man of incredible demands on your time and um, it's just great to see a scientist who's so focused on having a conservation outcome as well as learning about the natural environment so Thanks.